today's pleasure to introduce to you Giovanna Guidoboni. Giovanna has a master's in engineering and a PhD in math from University of Ferrara in Italy. Then she got a Fulbright fellowship to go to University of Houston as a postdoc, but then she was offered a position there, so she was there. Then she moved to IUPUI, where she is now, and she's also in the Department of Ophthalmology there, and she's a co-director of the Institute for Math Modeling and Computational Science. And she will talk to us about AI as a window on the body, mathematical modeling of retinal blood flow. Thank you. So thank you, Lorena, for inviting me here. It is a great pleasure. So uh, today I will talk about the modeling of the eye that I was basically talking to uh, by Dr. Alan Harris. He is here at the top. Uh, I just want to tell you how this story developed because for me it was a, really a surprise. So before moving to IPY, I was uh, studying the uh, theoretical and let's say the um, theoretical features of fluid structure interaction problems, which you know are applicable to blood flow. But I was not working directly with any physician or any surgeon. I was studying the mathematical properties of the system. And then I joined IPY, and then soon after, like maybe one month later or so. Uh, Dr. Harris, who is the director of clinical research at the Glicka Institute, organized a visit to the clinic. We, we were maybe 12 faculty from several departments of the School of Science, and he showed us all what he can measure in the eye, or what could be measured in the eye, and he was like, and yet we have this huge amount of data, but we do statistics and there are so many factors that we still don't understand what's going on, even though we can measure a lot of things. So we really need the help of mathematical modeling based on some first principles to try to interpret the data that we have. And so I was surprised, then I go back, I Google modeling of blood flow in the eye, and basically there was nothing. There is you know, modeling of blood flow in the brain, in the kidneys, uh, so, but the eye has been kind of leftover organ, nobody really started the blood flow there. So I thought, well, that's interesting, maybe we can start it. Moreover, I was pregnant and I thought, you know, if nothing else, in my sleepless night, I can at least read something on the eye. And so this is how this came along. And now we are quite a big group, so it started, let's say, three years ago. And now we uh, have three of the students in math and, and uh, also commentary fellows in, uh, in the ophthalmology department. So. What is this about? So alterations in retinal hemodynamics are associated with a lot of things, like uh, uh, cerebral diseases, like Alzheimer, uh, Parkinson, multiple sclerosis, systemic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and of, of course also diseases of the eye, like glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration. So in principle, you know, if you can understand the the rules that basically govern the blood flow in the retina, and you could understand how they are, you know, associated to several diseases. You could actually use the eye to, for, I mean, to diagnose or to monitor the progression of several diseases. So, just to show you some of the things I was impressed by when I visited the clinic. So, you know, they can take pictures with Fundus camera, and we have an expert in the audience. So, if I say things that are not so correct, I, I say it in my way or how I understand that. So these are fundus camera pictured on the retina, and you see that this is a normal one. Here you see all these spots, and here you see these other uh, micro aneurysms. So depending on it looks, the doctors can, can see uh, the structural changes, but they can do more. So this is uh, OCP, the optical coherence tomography. And so basically they can, they can do 3D scans of the back of the eye. So you can have this uh, 3D you know, geometry, as well as it goes down deeper and you can have sections of all the layers uh, that constitute the retina and you can see, for example, how this, uh, this kind of hole, let's say, deepens and so this would be a measure of how cells have been lost and so uh, you can have these uh, 3D images and also the depth. Moreover, uh, with the retinal oximeter, they can visualize in the main vessels in the retina, both arterials and venous, venous, the level of oxygen saturation inside the vessels. So they can see the measure of how much oxygen is in the arteries and in the vein would be some kind of indicator of how much oxygen has been taken by the tissue. And so, um, you know, in principle, they can infer something on how much has been used and if it is healthy or not. Then, uh, uh, now here is. Here is the eye ball, and with color doppler imaging, they can go a little deeper behind the ball, so they can go in the retrobulbar vessels, 
and uh, get you a profile of the velocity. So this is not flow, this is flat velocity. In the central retinal artery, and down here you have the central retinal vein. So you can also have this time dependent velocity profiles. And this is another instrument, uh, the hyperretinal flow meter. They can estimate, for example, how much volume of blood is in the microvasculature, so down to the capillary level. Not really a measure of velocity of flow, but for example, an amount of capillaries that are you know, active and how many have dropped out if, they, if there is some disease. So if they can measure all these things, why do we need modeling? So the interpretation of the data, as I told you, is pretty challenging. And the, the problem is that, so, if the eye is like a pressurized ball. There is this intraocular pressure inside that exerts a pressure outside the vessels. Then there is blood flow through the vessels that is driven by the, the blood pressure, the, the arterial blood pressure inside the vessels. So, I mean, depending on the combination of these pressures, you will have more flow or less flow. They are kind of counterbalancing each other. And they are different in every individual. We all have different blood pressures and different IP. Moreover, this pressure oscillates. So during the night, they are different than during the day. And uh, so bottom line, what I'm trying to say is that what you visualize here, uh, it might be a certain value that is good for me, but may, might not, the same value might not be good for somebody else who has different pressures. So, um, Mathematically, so basically, mathematically, we could try to understand the relationship between these pressures and maybe hopefully understand whether a certain range of values is good for whom. Now, the mathematics is complicated because there are a lot of fluid structure interactions going on here. And as you, I mean, as you know, fluid structure interactions are still area of research in, in mathematics. Uh, and I will try to, to explain you in particular uh, which, uh, well, here I have to write. So, uh, just to give you an idea, so this is the eye and this is the optic nerve that basically connects the eye with the brain and so it would be somewhere down here. So the eye is at a certain pressure, the eye will be, and then the optic nerve is at a different pressure because also our brain is pressurized but the level of pressure is a little lower than the eye. So here you have two ambient and different pressures so you need, uh, you know, something like a seal that can maintain the pressure difference. And so there is this kind of Lake, let's say, I don't know if you see it, there's a like gray area here. It is called lamina cubosa, and this is a, a tissue that has a lot of function. So it has to maintain the pressure difference between inside the eye and the optic nerve, but it has also to let all the nerve fibers go through because, of course, the cells in the retina here are, I mean, capture the light that then it transforms into a signal that has to travel to the brain through the axons. So this, this plate also has to have holes and let the axons go through. Moreover, I mean, the retina doesn't function without some blood that can take oxygen, and so the blood is actually taken in by the central retinal artery and taken up by the central retinal vein that then feed all this tissue here, and so they also have to go through this plate. And so as the pressure inside, the, I mean, yeah, yeah, as the pressure inside the eye or the pressure here in the optic nerve change, this membrane will deform like this. <laughs> And so, as it deforms, in particular at the top, we'll exert a compression on these vessels that go through. And, and so, these vessels are compliant, and the pain is collapsible. So, there is a, a, a fluid structure interaction there. That, of course, will change all the hemodynamics inside because if you, they are like two faucets, you know, if you close the outlet more than the inlet, you have a certain balance of pressure and stuff. So, uh, it is a so which one wins of this process is just not clear. Uh, and the different subsystems are we getting at the end, so I don't want to say it right now. Let us just say about the uh, so what so what are the current studies? So there are a lot of animal studies and clinical and population based studies that try to understand what is the relative importance of this IOP of the blood pressure. But the problem with animal studies is that the anatomy of the retina, the structure of this vascular system, and the balance of pressures is different depending on the species, and they are different from humans. For example, dogs have a different posture, and so the balance of pressure is different. Uh, cats uh, um, have different connections between the vessels here and the vessels here. So bottom line, it is not clear how much you can transfer from what you know on the animals on what you think happens on the humans. 
and clinical and population-based studies, I mean, these are the real data on humans, but there is a lot of individual variability of several factors, and so just the statistics, it is not clear to understand what's going on. And so here today you see an example of how mathematical models can help interpret clinical data. Just to give you an idea of the state of the art in the modeling, so there is a lot of work in ocular mechanics. So meaning, uh, uh, it started with floor to bone and now it has, I mean, there are uh, a whole, like, I don't know, a huge amount of people uh, that are doing this. So basically, finite element analysis of how different structures of the eye deform uh, as you change the pressures uh, inside the eye and outside. So this is an example of how far they've gone. I mean, this is uh, that lamina fibrosa I was talking about. This is a digitalization, let's say, of that lamina fibrosa taken for monkeys or real geometries that then they run finite element analysis on it and they can give you distribution of stresses and strains for different, for example, uh, for different geometries, different pressures. But the problem is that medical doctors do not measure stresses and strain. So, I mean, so the output of this modeling kind of sits there because, as you saw, what, what it can actually be measured are these velocities, blood flow, I mean, the, the blood velocity or, or some kind of morphology, but not the stresses and strain here. And then uh, there, is, there has been recently a few papers on the hemodynamics. So, for example, this is taken from work um, by Ganesan, in which a real uh, retinal, you know, this the retinal vasculature has been taken from some animals, and then the, these vessels are all considered to be fixed pipe, but then they solve Navier-Stokes equation through it, and there is a sort of distribution of, uh, actually, it is not just Navier-Stokes, they consider also this positive and dependent and macrocrate, so a sort of distribution of, of, of whatever, hemodynamics parameters. But, you cannot use this model to understand the relationship between this intraocular pressure acting on the vessels and the blood flow through them. Because here these vessels are assumed to be fixed pipes, so they don't feel the pressure outside. So there is hemodynamics, but not mechanics. So we try to combine the two, to try, the, to, try to combine the action of the intraocular pressure on these vessels, and to hopefully arrive to some output of the model that are actually that can actually be measured in the clinic, and so that we can interpret the clinical data. And so, in particular, today I will talk about this: uh, the relationship between changes in the intraocular pressure (IOP) and changes in retinal hemodynamics. So, the the clinical evidence, uh, I mean, says everything and the opposite. So, I was really surprised by this. Uh, so, for example. IOP, so this pressure inside the eye, can be changed in many different ways. So uh, the most radical one, I would say, is via surgery. Uh, so they can kind of drill a hole in, uh, in uh, the meshwork that allows the drainage of the fluid. And, and you can achieve, uh, let's say, a reduction in IOP of, let's say, 15 millimeters of mercury. And so it is kind of a significant reduction if you, if you think that the normal value of, of IOP is between 15 and 20 millimeters of mercury. So like people with 40 millimeters of mercury in IOP, that is quite high, they could go down to maybe 25, which is a pretty good deal. And one would expect that with such a change, you see changes in, in retinal blood flow because, I mean, you are relieving a lot of pressure from these vessels. But still, kind of uh, half of the studies report that actually they see changes in the retinal hemodynamics following the operation, and the other half report no changes. Then uh, you can reduce IOP with topical medications. This is less invasive, just with some drops, let's say, and there are different types of drops. And some studies report slight hemodynamic changes following you know, the use of these medications, and some others report no change. Or, and also, I mean, this, uh, this usually is done in people which are not healthy because, I mean, if you do surgery, it means that there is some problem there, and those if you are taking medications, you have problems. But you can alter IOP also if you are healthy just for the sake of clinical research by putting a suction cup on the cornea, you pump it a little bit, the pressure inside uh, increases, and then you measure what you want, you release the cup, and the pressure goes back to normal. So there are also data of IOP elevation on healthy individuals. And so there are some studies that report hemodynamic changes and some studies that report no change. So, what is the problem here? So, uh, I started very simple. Uh, I have, probably because I am an engineer, the, the, 
And so I thought, let us try to understand at least the, the, the action. I mean, in my opinion, and again, I'm not an ophthalmologist, but I was thinking, I mean, this IOP acts from the outside, pushing on these vessels, and the blood pressure is inside, trying to push the blood through and keep these vessels open. So let's try to understand the relationship between the two. So I started with a simple, um, you know, uh, network model, so using the hydraulic analogy for the blood flow in our vasculature. So, um, let's see. Okay, well, let's start here. So here you have the lamina fibrosa, which uh, here would be this region, that separates two areas. So here we have arterial capillaries and venules that, sits, that sit here inside the eye. And, and here we have the CRA and the CRP, which are the central retinal artery and the central retinal vein, that are outside the eye and they are inside the upper nerve. Then, um, so this, these two endians, let's say, are exposed to different external pressures. That is what I was telling you at the beginning. So this is the intraocular pressure. And these are LPP stands for retrolaminar tissue pressure. Nobody really knows exactly what that is. Uh, they say it is related to the cerebrospinal fluid pressure and the intracranial pressure. There are only some measurements on dogs that are also questionable. So we call it like this to say, oh sorry, to say following the literature that there is some pressure that is lower than IOP, maybe higher than what is in the brain, but what exactly it is, nobody really knows. Okay, so the system is driven by the pressure difference between input and output. So this would be the arterial pressure upstream of the central retinal artery, and the venous pressure downstream of the central retinal vein. So they don't measure it, so these measurements are not directly available. So we just uh, took some profile when we calibrated the model, solving an inverse problem, basically saying when everything is normal, that should be this normal individual, then we would expect to see a certain velocity profile in the CRA and in the CRV. So given that, we saw the inverse problem that gives us which pressure profile you should have here and here. And then we keep that profile fixed and we just change the mean of that depending on the value of the mean pressure of the individual. Uh, then, uh, then the resistance. So resistance is the, um, it gives you an idea of the resistance to flow of, of the vessels. And, uh, and of course, if you want to take into account the, the fact that these vessels are squeezed by the external pressure, you need to express the resistance as a function of these pressures. So, uh, let us first focus on these two. So these are the, we can call them intralaminar segments of this central retinal artery and central retinal vein. So again, the idea that this, this plate deforms and will squeeze the vessels through it. But actually, so arteries and veins are pretty different. So at first I modeled them to be the same and then the model was not giving reasonable results, and so I went back and went, huh, yeah, they are not the same. So arteries, when they deform, basically they they remain with a circular cross section. They have a strong, uh, they have a high pressure inside. The the wall is pretty strong. They have muscles and stuff. So they, so you you can assume that as it deforms, the cross section remains circular. But veins are not like that. The pressure inside the veins is much lower. And, uh, and they are known to collapse, so as the pressure increases outside, they really change shape. So, uh, ah, and also, so what is the pressure acting outside of these two segments? So, you have this lamina that deforms, uh, that deforms due to the pressure difference, and by the way, you have some tension here because this lamina is attached to the sclera, which is the shell of the eye, and the shell is inflated. So the more you inflate this shell, it will it will pull and it will pull the ends of this lamina. So the actually the action of IOP is not just linear, but it is in here and it is in the traction. So uh, we did a simplifying assumption. So let us first let, let us consider let us let us say let us look for the state of stress of the lamina, assuming that basically the presence of the vessels here will not significantly change the state of stress in the lamina, and there are this work of the finest element guys supporting this assumption. And uh, and then we put this, then I show you how we put the stress on the vessels. So let us first see the lamina. 
we consider that it is a circular plate with a certain finite thickness so that we can solve the problem in, uh, in 2D with, uh, I mean, 3D axial asymmetry. Then uh, uh, we consider just the equilibrium equation, so the divergence of S equal to zero, S is the stress tensor. It is, it, we are considering nonlinear elasticity in the sense that this E, which is the strain tensor, has both the linear part and the quadratic part, so we can allow for kind of larger displacements. And uh, this lambda, LC, and mu LC, which are the material properties of this elastic material, are not constant, but they depend on the effective stress, and the effective stress is a combination of the components of the stress. Uh, and how they depend on it, through, uh, we took a free linear uh, constitutive equation that, that was actually obtained in the 70s by somebody called Wu, which is still kind of the state of the art. There has not been a lot of measurements in that. So uh, I have your lambda, but you can really lambda to the young modules, and, and you is the shear modules. And so basically, they have different, so they are different values depending on the range in which the effective stress is. <coughs> OK, well, this just, just uh, you know, then you have a nonlinear problem, so how do you solve it? This is just to say uh, we use an iterative scheme, like a fixed point iteration scheme, in which uh, I mean, you need to be a little bit careful uh, when you discretize it because E is not linear, there is this quadratic component. So um, in L, we decompose it by taking, let's say, the linear part and the nonlinear part. This is what this L is, and the N is here. And so you see this quadratic part decomposed like this, so that then when you put everything together, this guarantees that the, um, that the bilinear form that you have here is actually a uh, positive depth. Uh, it is really not sophisticated. It's, it's just that. We, so we assume a certain effective stress. By assuming the effective stress that the material properties are given, then you solve the problem with given material properties. Then you can, um, what is it? So then you can reconstruct the stress, which gives you a new effective stress. And depending on how different it is from your initial guess or from you know, the, the, the effective stress of the previous step, you decide to stop or not. OK, so this was pretty simple. So the results are, the, uh, this is just to give an idea of what to expect. So here, and I'm sorry I didn't write it, so these colors are the stress maybe I I was told I can write here, so you will. Um, you have this, uh, you have this lamina. This is your axis of symmetry, and I call this direction S, and this is C. So the images that you, the colors that you see are the components S, S, S of the stress. So it is the normal component along the direction S. Why is that? Because I mean. This component is the one that will compress the vessel through it. And this is to see, for different levels of intraocular pressure, so 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, you see, uh, look at particular, so here, at this, this will be the center, this will be the axis of symmetry, where the vessels are. You see that from 15 to 40, there is this area, deep blue, that is popping up, popping up. And the blue area are the negative values of this component of the stress. Meaning that as you increase IUP, there will be a bigger portion, let's say, of the of these central retinal vessels that will that will experience a compression. And this compression will be more and more you know, elevated as you increase the IUP. This is all what this is saying. Okay, so uh, this is to say. Uh, what I just said, so along the uh, along this axis, actually now we remember that there are the central retinal vein and the central retinal artery, and this is a picture of this SSS, so the uh, normal stress in the right of direction, along the along the central axis here. So this would be the axial coordinate of the lamina, positive or negative. As you increase, I repeat, it moves this way. You see that it is trilinear because we had the trilinear assumption in the material properties of the lamina, and uh, it is here at the top that it gets negative. So uh, we remember where we want to go. We want to put uh, to have a sort of law for the resistance of that interlaminar segment, 
And so now we do, so the artery remains kind of circular, so we take this uh, stress to be the external pressure that acts on the artery. And I say it depends on Z, where Z would be the, uh, at, I mean, the, the, the coordinate around the center line of the vessel. So uh, this is, if we go with the Laplace law, uh, Laplace law tells you that basically the pressure difference between inside, actually here I have P, P would be the P bar, so the pressure inside the vessel minus the pressure outside the vessel, and this K is just a constant that depends on the particular quantity, will be equal to a function of this alpha. And alpha is the ratio between the deformed area, cross-sectional area, and the cross-sectional area of the reference configuration. So this is an assumption that we are saying that, again, the pressure difference uh, will be related to the change in area through this equation. And this is the Laplace law. Uh, which again has the assumption that the cross-sectional area remains circular. So it is good for the arteries, not so good for the veins. However, once we do that, then we can take the, the equations of the flow, and these are basically take the Navier-Stokes equations, average them over the cross-section, make some assumptions of smallness, and basically you get to this. Uh, Kr is a parameter, and also there are assumptions behind that, that if you take it like this, it means that you are assuming a causal flow. And then here I am just solving, I am integrating over the length 0L, because bottom line, we want to arrive to a resistance. And the resistance in the electric analogy is the ratio between the pressure difference and the flow. Bottom line, we arrive to something like that, which means that for this intra or intralaminar segment of the CLA, our resistance depends on uh, our resistance uh, depends on the diameter, diameter to the fourth power, and of course, uh, I didn't write it, I'm so sorry, but of course A, so the A that you have there in alpha would be pi diameter squared divided by 4, because we are assuming that it remains circular. And so, oh, and so bottom line, your resistance will depend on the, on the cross-sectional area, which depends through this relationship on the external pressure. And this external pressure is uh, the stress exerted by the lamina on the vessel. For the veins, we uh, use a similar approach. So again, A is the cross-sectional area, but now we are not assuming anymore that it remains circular, because veins do not. And this is a classic picture that you might find in many papers talking about the starting resistor, uh, which is basically alpha, which is this change in area, and it gets closer to zero, meaning when the vein starts closing, you see different slopes of this curve because the, the cross-section is actually changing the shape. And this translates into this constitutive equation. If alpha is larger than 1, which means that the current area is larger than the reference one, you can go with the Laplace law because it means you are in this section, I mean, this um, portion of the graph where you have circular cross-section. But as alpha gets less than 1, meaning that the, your cross-sectional area is decreasing, so it gets squeezed, then you go here in the other slope, and so it has been shown by... Um, uh, it, has, it, it has been uh, used a lot, um, this kind of relationship. Okay, and we can do the same trick to obtain the resistance, so basically we take the equation of flow, and we are again integrating over the cross-section, and uh, you, I mean, you know all the theory behind, you realize that this is quite a strict assumption because we are assuming again for that flow there, even though the beat will not. So indeed, uh, uh, as a mathematical development of all this, uh, obtaining a better um, representation of this resistance could be indeed a direction to go. But at least to have an idea, we continue like that, and then, so the pressure difference at the end of this uh, section divided by Q gives you the resistance. 
which is then related to the external pressure here through this relationship, which reflects the fact that the constitutive equation depends on alpha if it is larger, oh, sorry, larger than one or less than one. So, uh, we have examined so how we took uh, the dependence on the external pressure for this segment and this segment. Now, let's see the values. So, the values are I mean, we could do all this very detailed analysis on the central retinal artery and the central retinal vein because they are just single vessels experiencing a pressure outside. The venules, I mean, there are a lot of vessels, so if we do this for every vessel, it gets crazy. But actually, there is literature for the brain, and in particular, this is a relationship by, developed by Ursino in ADA, which says, let us take a lamp approach. So forget about trying really to model each single vessel in this compartment. But we can take that the resistance of this compartment that I put afterward is obtained as a factor, factor multiplying an average value. And you see, as T34, which is here the pressure upstream of the vessels, is equal to the IUT, which is the pressure outside, the, here the denominator goes to zero and the resistance goes to infinity, meaning that the values will close. So basically, this, uh, I, I mean, this, this kind of uh, relationship for the resistance tells you that uh, the values will collapse if the pressure outside, upstream, uh, is equal to the pressure to IOT. And this has been used again in the brain. And then one more thing. So the arterioles. So arterioles are different because till now I have talked about vessels that are, sque are squeezed and passively change their diameter. Arterioles can actually change their diameter in an active way because they have muscles around and they can adjust and try to dilate or constrict to maintain a relatively constant blood flow even though the pressure changes. And that is very important because our retina needs to have just the right amount of blood through it because if we have too much blood we don't see properly because we, in order to have clear vision we don't have to have too much blood around but if you, we don't have enough blood then we don't have enough oxygen and cells will die so it is very delicately, delicately regulated and here we take uh, in this approach we take just a phenomenological approach and we just say that the resistance here of arterials change according to some formula that basically guarantees, guarantees that the system, this is the normalized blood flow in the system, as you change the blood pressure, I mean the, the, the blood pressure through the system, you have a certain plateau. So uh, basically this change in resistance is able to give uh, a res reasonably constant blood flow over a certain range of pressure. Of course, it is not perfect because our system is not perfect. So, if you are outside this range, then the flow will actually change. But if the resistance is constant, so if you don't have out regulation, the system will just follow this line, meaning that as you, as you decrease the blood pressure, the flow will just decrease. Okay, we are almost there to see some results. So, then we have also capacitance, this green. Up, that is the ability to store blood volume. And so bottom line, mathematically, this system reduces to solve basically a system of no linear OBEs. Uh, P, the unknowns are the pressure of different nodes. C is the capacitance which is given. And these Gs are combination of the resistances. And the system is non-linear because the resistances depend also on the pressure. And so it is a non-linear OBE system. And we use an increased volume scheme. And, uh, we need to test that the solution that we get is actually periodic because the input and output pressure depend on time and they are periodic, so we want to make sure that the solution <coughs> is periodic. And I don't want to claim that the difficulty here is the math itself because it is relatively simple, but the difficulty has been to really set up the model so that it gives something reasonable. So, first of all, validation. I was really surprised that we obtained these results. So, this is what you see. The thick black line in the three panels are the simulations of the model. And uh, these uh, um, triangles and dots and, and these lines, these are all clinical data from different, uh, um, yeah, from different studies. And we did not use these studies to calibrate any of the model parameters. The model parameters, which I didn't list, but contain 
like viscosity of blood, elasticity of the vessel walls, um, and, the, and the properties of the lamina cribosa. We have taken there from the literature, some are animal studies, some are uh, some other models. So, I mean, you know that when you choose parameters for a model, you kind of need to be lucky and hope that everything works because they are not all from humans. But still, uh, so this is, so here you see S for different vessel diameters, uh, you see the velocity in the arterial side and the venous side, and it works relatively well. And here also you see flow in milliliters per liter in the arteries and veins. And here the average blood flow that we get as we change the arterial pressure. So we are on the simulation uh, for the contour state of IOP equal to 15 and the blood pressure 120 over 80. So kind of a normal health individual. And of course you can ask me, but how did you get the values for all the vessel diameters that you have a lamp model? So what we did, uh, there is a paper by Takahashi, I'm sorry that I didn't put the picture. He used the binary branching approach to have a sort of geometry of the retina. And basically we used that to obtain this, uh, this curve. So we were pretty happy about the agreement. And so, okay, let's go with the theoretical predictions. Remember the original question was, how do we expect the retinal hemodynamics to change as we change IUP? And again, I mean, we tried on three different theoretical individuals with different blood pressures. So H, HP, HBP means high blood pressure that in our model we took to be 140 over 90. And then NBP, normal blood pressure, 120 over 80. LBP is low blood pressure, 100 over 70. And so you see uh, that there are two lines in this uh, panel because in the first, in the first line, everything is working, the outer regulation is working, and you see three different curves. The blue is for the hypertensive, the black is for the normal tensive, and the green is for the one with low blood pressure. And this here is because autoregulation plays a big role, and there is a big community in ophthalmology claim, claiming that maybe glaucoma and other progressive diseases are related to dysfunction of the autoregulation. So the motor we can just switch it on and off, and it is pretty easy because if the autoregulation works, then we have that change in resistance in the arterials according to whatever low we gain. And if the autoregulation is not working, we just set the resistance of arterials to be constant and see what happens. So in this second line here, the dash lines are in the case that autoregulation is absent, so we assume that the re resistance of arterials is fixed. So, I mean, this is us, I, I was pretty impressed because let's see the normal individual. So let's follow the black, the black line. So this says that if a normal individual, you increase IOP, because IOP, oh, yeah, IOP is what you have on the x-axis. If you increase IOP from 15 to 30 millimeters of mercury, 15 to 30, basically you wouldn't see any change of anything, because you have your plateau in the blood flow. This is PSV, this is the peak systolic velocity in the central retinal artery. So this is a velocity that they measure with the color doctor imaging. So I thought it this because this is what they can measure in the clinic. So uh, PSV and EPP means uh, peak systolic velocity and then diastolic velocity. So with the color doctor imaging, they have, let's say, oh, sorry. Oh, maybe I have a cancer. So let's say like this, this would be the peak systolic velocity, this would be the end diastolic velocity that they measure with color doctor imaging. So, if you have an individual, again, has a normal blood pressure and autoregulation is working, and you increase the interocular pressure from 15 to 30 millimeters of mercury, you basically wouldn't see any change in anything. No change in blood flow and no change in the velocity. But if in the same individual, no, or let's say, but if you increase interocular pressure from 15 to 30 in an individual with high blood pressure, and so we would follow the black line, not for the blue line, you see a decrease in blood flow, a decrease in velocity, and a decrease in, I mean, a decrease in both the peak and the ancestral velocity. Because the plateau is shifted. So the plateau in IOP 
is not fixed in a certain range. It shifts with the pressure inside the vessels. So depending on, your, depending on the blood pressure of, of an individual, you would see, let's say, change or no change for the same range of variation in intraocular pressure. So then we said, so maybe that is what happened in the literature. Not all the studies actually reported the blood pressure of the individuals that they uh, were examining. They had only the change in IOP and the change in velocity. They were not saying what the blood pressure was of the individuals, at least not all of them. And then we also say something else. Uh, if there is some sort of impairment of the autoregulation, you wouldn't see any plateau whatsoever. So meaning that whatever change you have in IOP, that is reflecting changes in blood flow, changes in velocity, whatever your blood pressure is. Okay, so this was very interesting. So and now we compare it with some of the uh, work that I mentioned before. So these are data by Alan Harris in 96. Uh, and so what is this? So the thick systolic and then diastolic velocity in the central retinal artery was measured on 11 healthy individuals, in principle right after the suction cup was put in, so to reduce the effects of autoregulation. So basically we compare the results of our order, so the velocity that we get, thick systolic and then diastolic, as we change IOP, for the model in which the blood pressure is normal and the autoregulation is absent. Again, it is not data fitted, it is just comparing, uh, because of course, uh, I mean, uh, the, the data reported in the, in the study were just these points here, and we didn't know anything about the material properties or the geometrical properties of the rating of these people. But I was quite impressed to see how the behavior looks very similar. And uh, I will be honest with you, at first it didn't look like that, because I was working on the arteries only before moving to this business, and very naively, I took the Laplace law in that uh, compliant tube, both for the artery and the vein. And if I do that, the thick systolic velocity behaves more or less in a certain way, in the, in the same way, but the anti velocity doesn't go down as the data. And actually, and there are also some other stuff that I will show you, but in this is in particular what happens. And then if, I, if we change Laplace law for the CRA, and that starting resistor for the CRB, so we allow the change in shape for the vein, then actually we get a much better shape, a much better agreement. And this uh, kind of is in agreement with the general thought in ophthalmology that the veins plays, uh, play a crucial role in regulating, in, in not regulating, but in uh, governing the blood flow in the retina. Okay, and then this is, uh, these are data related to uh, trabeculectomy. So I told you that you can decrease IOP by doing a surgery and drilling the hole. So these are three different studies. Uh, as you see, the last seat does not report the blood pressure. MIP means mean arterial pressure, and it does not report it. Tribal et al. they report it, and it is a little higher than normal. So we run our simulation for the hypertensive case with and without autoregulation. And uh, you see that, so this is, these are the mean values and the variances of the IUT before and after operation. You see that there is a decrease more or less of 15, so we run the simulation with 30 before and 15 after operation. And we compare, for example, this is the change in fixed systolic velocity that we get with our model, and this is the change that, this is the mean of the change that they get. There is no variance because they do not really report the change. They, they get, uh, so this, this is the change in the mean value. So I was impressed because, I mean, we are there not only qualitative, in a qualitative way, but also in a quantitative way. I mean, the change is more or less one centimeter per second as expected. And the end diastolic and, uh, and the resistive index, we show the same trend, even though you see that also the data themselves are not really such a good agreement. And this is because also the measurements for the peak systolic velocity are usually much more consistent because the signal is very strong. And the end diastolic that is to work here has much more variability than in the measures. Okay, so, I mean, till now everything looks very good. I mean, that the mathematical model could have explaining this complex relationship between blood pressure and IUP. And by the way, I've been told that many doctors visit in ophthalmology, I mean, considering the blood pressure is not common practice. And, uh, but, and also because the level of IUP can
can be after, you know, with the drops and stuff, but in particular with glaucoma and other diseases that come with older age, uh, the blood pressure of a patient is not really something you want to mess up with because you don't want high blood pressure because they can damage a lot of other things. So basically, one, uh, I mean, one possible use of this model, and this is what we are trying to do now, is can we use it to try to optimize the target level of IOP based on the you know, the, the factors that each individual patient presents. And this is what we are going to be working, working on. Then uh, we are also working in getting the model more complex, which is, I mean, the, we have now just this network model, but uh, this is how the retina actually looks like going in the depth here. There are several layers, and actually there are two capillary layers, one superficial and one uh, more deep. And uh, here is one, the deep, and here is the choroid. And so now we are working in actually uh, using a diffusion limited algorithm to get uh, a more realistic description of the geometry of these vessels. And then each branch here is uh, basically modeled as a, as a one-dimensional uh, compliant tube. And uh, uh, in the arteries, we are, this one-dimensional model for the arteries actually take into, takes into account that there are three different layers of tissue uh, in which we, through which we want to study oxygen diffusion and transport. And the tissue that is here surrounding all these vessels have actually several layers, and each of them have a different rate of oxygen consumption because they are made of different cells. And uh, uh, now I don't have the time to go through this, but there are, so basically there are equations for the fluid, for the transport of oxygen through the, uh, I mean, inside the arterial sea, the oxygen transport through the vessel wall and the oxygen dynamics in the tissue. And what we are using it for, but I mean, this is still work in progress, is to get, for example, a profile of the oxygen across the tissue. And this hopefully will give us uh, a better idea of the role of the choroid in all this. The choroid is like a basin of oxygen and blood that is behind the retina, which is not really easy to access and visualize in humans, but it's going to play an important role in providing oxygen, and we are trying to understand that. Uh, and uh, uh, this is an example of how, uh, I mean, what the model is predicting now. So arterioles, different levels of these branches, see, uh, show a different ratio of the level of oxygen in the lumen across the layers of the wall and outside. And actually, there are some other papers from the 80s saying that actually the gradient of oxygen across the arterial walls seem to play an important role in, in the auto-regulation of the retina. Uh, of course, we are doing all this because it is not very nice to have that phenomenological law for the resistance in arterial. So we just gave it to, so that it could do what we wanted it to do. And now we are trying to go back to the biochemistry of it and try to have a modeling of the auto-regulation, which is coupled with the blood flow, because of course, depending on the blood flow, you have a different transport of the oxygen and diffusion of the oxygen, which then will be experienced in the tissue in different ways, and that should trigger the auto-regulation mechanism. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, the story will never finish, because I was telling at the beginning there are several vascular beds. They are all important, and they are connected in a kind of tricky way. So we started from the retina, because there are more measurements, because there is one input and one output, so it was kind of manageable. But, so now I have a student with which we are working on the blood flow in the lamina. Because I show you the lamina was just an elastic plate. I was not studying the blood flow through it. But actually there are some diseases like, like glaucoma for which the site of injury is actually thought to be inside here. That the axons are somehow damaged. And, but, but current imaging techniques cannot reach down here. So hopefully with the what I want to do really to do was to couple this four elastic border for the blood flow in the lamina with the blood flow in the retina so that to have like an estimate of if we see changes of 10%, let's say, of the blood flow in the retina, would it correspond to a 10% change in the blood flow in the lamina or, or maybe 20% or maybe, I don't know, 5% depending on some factors that change with individuals? These are the questions we are trying to, to ask. And, uh, and just one, uh, ah, and then another thing. So the lamina itself 
takes the blood from here, from outside, the, the posterior ciliary arteries, but it drains inside the central retinal vein. So it has the same output as the retina, but they are different inputs. So the system algebraically is kind of complicated. And uh, I, my, my son said, okay, the eye is kind of interesting, but the brain is much cooler. Why don't you study the brain? <laughs> that is actually true. So, I mean, th th that is interesting in the sense that there are several also brain or neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson, Parkinson and Alzheimer's that show up in the eye too. So there are already several uh, models, I mean, from simpler to more complex, uh, describing the blood through the brain, and I really would like to connect the eye with the brain. And the relationship is not only through the blood flow. It is true that because then, you know, the, uh, this old blood thing will go into the cavernous sinus that then drains into the jugular vein and goes to the brain, part of it drains through that. But, I told you about this pressure behind the retrolaminal tissue pressure, which is related to the cerebrospinal fluid pressure, the intracranial pressure, which then has an effect on the blood flow in the brain. So the eye and the brain are connected through the blood flow and through this delicate balance of pressures, which is not yet, I mean, and the mechanisms regulating it, so the relationship between all these pressures is not clear. Uh, that's it. I hope I didn't bother you too much. Uh, I I don't want to take the credit for it. I did a lot, but Dr. Harris is really the one who initiated it, and I think it is very good to work with somebody who thinks that what you do is really helpful. And uh, I hope that if nothing else, I saw your nice pictures. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Yes. You said that you didn't adjust the parameters. No. But you do kind of sensitivity analysis if fractured parameters. Actually, this is, a, I don't know if I, if I listed that one of the things I wanted to do. Uh, yeah. There are many parameters and we need to do sensitivity analysis. And we didn't do it yet. Um, I mean, these results are really recent. Um, and, uh, and indeed, in particular, there are several parameters that might change with age, for example, and gender. And this age and gender and ethnicity are actually risk factors for several ocular diseases. So it would be interesting to see really um, what among all these parameters influence the most, the results. And I have not done it yet, uh, but it needs to be done. <laughs> You have the, the stress dependent elasticity. Why not rather than strain dependent elasticity? Just because there was, the, I mean, the, the only paper that we could find with some values of something yeah. <laughs> gave that relationship. However, uh, th there are more recent results, really recent, like maybe two or two years ago, of somebody um, who has a background in biomedical engineering who revisited those, those works of the 70s and basically uh, obtain the, um, an energy density function that depends on the collagen orientation and the fibrils and uh, so, um, I mean, and it has an exponential relationship like most of the real tissue, let's say. And actually, so I hoped we could go with that, but I started with something simpler, which was, again, kind of an extension of the linear elasticity, and, and the values were available in the literature, so I did that. Okay. Thank you. Are there any specific diseases that are going to cause the high IOP, or is that kind of just something that happens? Ah, so maybe our, <laughs> uh, this I tell you what I know. So, like, for example, uh, elevated IOP seems to correlate with high blood pressure, even though if it is high systolic or high diastolic, it's not really clear. Moreover, uh, there are people uh, with uh, high IOP, which is called ocular hypertension, that develop glaucoma, so which is the progressive vision loss or damage of whatever the other right or random cells and stuff. But there are other people, like 20% or 25% of the people with ocular hypertension, which would not develop glaucoma. So it is not, so it is now the common understanding that it is not the value of IOP per se 
that would determine you know, the progression or the onset of some diseases. It is, it is IOP with something else, but what is this something else is not really clear. So this whole uh, people, this whole community working on finite elements uh, put a lot of emphasis on the fact that if you change the geometry of the lamina, so if it is, a, a, for example, if it is a thinner, then it will experience higher, higher stresses, or if it is, and actually, um, for example, the thickness of the lamina has been shown to be correlated with, for example, myopia. So myopic, myopia, it is kind of an enlargement of, uh, I mean, change the shape of the eye. And so also the properties, the geometrical properties, and also the material properties of this lamina will change. But these are all theoretical investigations uh, trying to study how the distributions of stresses and strain for a given IOP change if you change geometry or, or you know or material properties. Then exactly what it means, it is not clear. Also because the damage to the axis I mean, that go through could be mechanical damage because they are sitting there and then the the collagen layers kind of get uh, you know in a shear uh, situation and, and, and the fibers just go like this and so maybe it is mechanical damage and breakage of these axons. Or it could be ischemic damage. So basically, it has this lamina that forms in the, the, the capillaries that are through it that you know deliver the nutrients to everything. Maybe it gets squeezed, and then some regions do not get enough nutrients or oxygen. But we go really to speculative, uh, you know, ideas. And so, with the modeling, hopefully, we can try to estimate in a quantitative way, for example, what would be the risk of ischemic damage in the lamina if you increase IOP. So, and what would be the shear stress, for example? So, would be, it is, is it more likely that the damage is through the stress or through the ischemic, you know, uh, instance? I don't know, this is where we would like to go. Mm. Recently, they, they showed that it's possible to estimate the ICP somehow through the eye. Yes, some, yes. Some, some weird thing. yes, yes. Do you have any? That. Yes, so actually I think that in the next month so one of these uh, experimental uh, instruments will come to Indianapolis. So Alan Harris is involved in that. I mean, meaning in the, you know, it is an it is an experimental stage, so they have to do with the testing and stuff. And uh, what, what I know it is just that it is based on, so they use deeper color doctor or deep doctor to detect the velocity in the phantic artery and maybe here in the central retinal artery and depending on the difference in, in the shape. Since uh, the ophthalmic artery runs outside the optic nerve, so it doesn't experience the, this, uh, this pressure. While the central retinal artery pierces the optic nerve, so it feels the pressure inside. So depending on how different the, the profiles of the velocity here and here look, then it could infer something on how much is the pressure here. But this is as much as I know. Yeah. So, what are the main factors or good factors for a good modeling of the uh, ocular platform? Uh, <laughs> good modeling. It depends. I would say it depends what the question is. So, for example, here the question. I mean, it took really a lot, it took maybe two years to pin down a first concrete question that we should try to address. Uh, and that was, for example, how would the platform in the retina change with IOP? And, and among the millions of questions that were on the table, this seemed to be a, a first good start because there was a lot of literature contradicting each other, I mean, and uh, there were data uh, because the, there are a lot of things that can be measured, so these published literature actually present the data, even though they were not unanimous, but they were data that we could interpret. Uh, and the IOP is something that everybody measures, I mean everybody, that is common to measure. And so we said, let's start from this. So since this was the question, then we said, then let us start with a simple modeling of the network, like with these resistances, to see how the how some of the factors that we think might play a role are actually related, and so then we went with whatever the you know with, with these resistances and the deformation of the lamina and stuff. But and so I would say I mean I know it is mine, but I would say this is a good model to answer that question. But it is not a good model 
for example, if you ask the question, why why is the isn't true there? So inferior, uh, superior, nasal, and temporal there. So why are differences in blood flow happening in the inferior quadrant of the retina before the, I mean, before the superior or before the nasal? Because this model does not distinguish between quadrants of the retina. So in order to address that question, this model is not good. Uh, one would need uh, a model that accounts for the uh, real geometry or real, I mean, the, the, the spatial distribution of all these vessels. So I would say the first rule for a good model is having a clear question that you want to address and then you see what to put in. And also maybe there are a lot of other questions and these were the questions that I felt I had the expertise to try to address because, I, I mean, this is what I know how to do, but for example, I am learning a lot about this biochemistry of oxygen and stuff because I never studied it before. And so I, I just wanted to start with something to handle. So here you, <coughs> excuse me, you compare uh, people with IOP and trauma IOP. Yes. So what if somebody has glaucoma but uh, with normal tension? So where do you put them yes. in this? So, in my opinion, uh, so normal tension of glaucoma means that the person is progress. I mean, has vision loss of some degree, and he progresses, but the IOP is normal. So uh, I don't think that the model I showed you can answer the question why people develop glaucoma. It can answer. It can try to answer the question. I mean, uh, let me say another thing. So the person who actually works on the instrument that he was talking about. One of the people, she's in Lithuania, and she also worked with Alan Harris, and uh, they had a lot of data on people with normal tension glaucoma. But what are these data? They are only always related to the retina, because this is what you can measure, even though the damage in glaucoma very likely happens here. So this is why we saw with these other students, we have developed a form elastic model to describe the blood flow through the lamina, because in my opinion, what the, but it is my opinion, not a doctor, but in my opinion, the, what happens is that if your blood, if sorry, if uh, your IOP is fine, but either your blood pressure is low, so there is not much uh, guiding force through the tissue, or your lateral lamina tissue pressure is low, lower, so that basically is in this the form like that. In my opinion, what happens is that uh, the perfusion of the lamina is compromised. So the damage, in my opinion, is not in the retina itself; it is in the lamina. That, that the form is differently and the blood flow doesn't go through very, you know, like normal and something happens. So actually what we were trying to talk with this Lorena was trying to set a sort of control problem to see how the people find estimates for the velocity and the pressure inside the lamina depending on the IUP and the retinal lamina tissue pressure and the tension and see which one of these factors would affect the most the perfusion of the lamina. Because right now I can just say there are many factors that contribute to it but I don't know which one, you know, would weigh the most. And so this is why we're trying to model it. But this is kind of more theoretical modeling in the sense that there are no direct data. So hopefully then I can relate it with the retina because the retina we can see it. And so hopefully we can relate what we can see with what we cannot see using the model for both. But it is kind of, I don't know, maybe next year or two years or ten, I don't know how long it will take. In this case, um, from the data they have with the oximetry and the IOP, is there a relationship between the oxygenation and the IOP level, or is that...? Yes, actually, unfortunately, I don't have my computer here, but there is another... So, we studied that, and so there is another paper that that is already published. This work is not published yet. Uh, it is submitted and it is under revision. But, uh, so there is this paper that we wrote with uh, Sierra, she is a system professor in my department and is published in IOBS. So, uh, with a different model of the retina, we accounted also for the oxygen saturation and the, the blood pressure and IOP. And so, for example, we saw that, uh, so the model had five different compartments, the large arterioles, small arterioles, capillaries, small venules, and and large venues, 
And so, like in a normal person, you go from 90 something, let's say 98, uh, down to maybe 60 percent in oxygen saturation. So, and then okay, and then here you have something like this, whatever the, the main drop is in the capillaries, and then you have something like this. And so then we, we then we try to see what happens if the IOP is the same, but the blood pressure of a person is different. And we assume that the tissue uh, consumption remains the same. And so then, then we saw this, so I mean, this remains the same because it is the incoming oxygen saturation in the arteries that doesn't really change much. And so depending on the blood pressure, I mean, this, this is too high, but this line here would go here or would go here. And, and so these values would be the normal values of the oxygen saturation to expect in a person with a certain IOP and different blood pressure. And, and so there are all things like that. And so what we were trying to say is that they take these images uh, that I showed at the beginning, the level of oxygen saturation. So what does it mean if in a person, instead of uh, a decrease of 40%, you see a decrease of, I don't know, uh, maybe 20% so that it stays up here. Does it mean that there is something wrong with the person or not? So the model suggests that you cannot conclude just, you cannot conclude anything just based on these values. You have to couple it with an estimate of the blood flow through the system, which is dictated by the IOP and the blood pressure. So what we are, so in other words, this value would be okay for a person with the blood pressure the level here, but it would be very bad for a person with a normal blood pressure because it means that probably the tissue is damaged and didn't use as much as it needed to. So in any way, so this uh, we are trying to use the model to try to interpret the data from oximetry to, but the model that I presented you doesn't have oxygen function, so it cannot be used for that. <laughs> Uh, we have data uh, on retinal symmetry and IOP. So what we saw is that uh, people with glaucoma and um, high blood pressure, they have uh, normal oxygenation in arteries, but in veins, increases. And the same in diabetic retinopathy. So it's the extraction that is not uh, working well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's take two more minutes.